All right, so uh, welcome everybody to our webinar, What is Production Design? Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, learn and work, the lands of the Bunurung people of the Kulin Nation here on the South Bank campus at Melbourne Uni. We pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging, and we acknowledge that stories have been told on this land for hundreds of generations, always was, always will be Aboriginal land. Um, so welcome to our webinar. Just a brief moment that this holding slide for what is production design is a photograph of a film set that was designed and made by Master of Production Design students here at the BCA um, in early 2021. <laughs> um, it was one of the 2020 graduating films that of course was delayed due to, due to lockdown. So it was designed by our graduate Waco um, and this photo um, uh, shows the set lit um, underway. So um, to introduce ourselves to be starting um, today um, uh, and to tell you a little bit about the session, we're going to explain a little bit about the fields of production design for both stage and screen. And we will have time for questions at the end. So please pop them in the chat if you have any questions at any stage and, um, and we'll get to those at the end. So I'm Jo Briscoe. Um, I'm the coordinator of the Master of Production Design and I am primarily a production designer for screen. Um, but over the course of my career, I started actually as a set and costume designer for theatre um, before I moved over to, to being a production designer for screen. Um, and I still uh, do some of that work outside my work here at the VCA. Uh, and hello, I'm Richard, Richard Roberts. I'm the head of design at, here at the VCA which is uh, design has a number of different areas, including performance design, which is what I do. That's my specialty. I'm a set and costume designer for stage. Um, having done that for in excess of 40 years. Um, <laughs> and uh, so it, I've combined my career as a designer with a career as an educator for, for quite a long time. Yeah. So hello. Hi. Um, and we're joining you today from our South Bank campus, um, which is where our design courses are based. So what is production design? Um, it's one of those fields that people don't necessarily understand what production design is. So I will just play this little YouTube video, which is a really great distillation of what production design is. It goes for just over five minutes. Uh, note that there is a little bit of course language in um, some of the clips, but it exp explains a little bit about um, what production design is, and it's called In Praise of Chairs. My name is Tony, and this is Every Frame of Painting. Here's a weird question. Have you ever watched a scene and thought, that's a great chair. I don't mean the chair would be great to own, though that would be nice. Just that somebody took the time to find the exact right chair for the story. And that attention to detail has paid off in some way. There are five different types of chairs in this hotel room. Holy fuck, what are they all doing if these are five different types of chairs? Get them out of here, man. Because in film, a chair is not just a chair. It's a piece of production design. And the type of chair you choose can say everything about the person and the world they inhabit. Papers. Business papers. So let's shop around. If you'd like to see the names of the films, press the CC button below. Let's say you've already written a story. What use is something like this to you? Well, the first and most common use of a chair is as an extension of the world. This is how you and I see them every day. We think of them as part of the environment. But an audience can take one look at them and tell whether the world is bright and clean or a little more run down whether our characters have very little money or plenty of it. You can't sell leaf tables, no chairs. Chairs, you got a dinette set. No chairs, you got dick. Like all production design, the right chair gives us an entire world to imagine beyond the frame. Ugly, don't think. Yet it has a certain appeal. The Lysa Aaron of chairs. And it also offers a very simple way to show power and hierarchy. The head of the monarchy, the captain of the ship, or the ruler of the whole empire. Welcome, Captain Skyler. The second and more unusual use of a chair is as an extension of a particular character. For instance, you might have someone who's weak and insecure. 
I have so arranged that he will always be looking up at you. You looking down at him. <laughs> Very good. Who tries to keep other people down. And yet his plans are always challenged, and he can never be on top. Very good. Yeah. Very good. You like it? In other words, a chair can represent the psychology of a person. If they're vain, if they lack inhibition, or if they really like joysticks. And if you consider animation, you can push this even further by drawing chairs that resemble the character. Notice here how Carl's square head is similar to his chair, while Ellie's round head and ears resemble hers. After she dies, Carl keeps her chair nearby, so that every time we see it, we're reminded of how much he loved her. But the third option is probably the most widely applicable. A chair can be the extension of a situation. Do you believe that's true? Do you believe that? In this scene from The Godfather Part 2, notice how Fredo tries to sit up. I've always taken care of you, Fredo. Taking care of me? But his chair won't let it. You're my kid brother, you take care of me? And the more he fidgets, the more powerless he looks. There's something about that chair that worked so great for the scene because he kept saying, you know, I'm your older brother and stuff like that. And the chair just kind of made him be so limp and springy and kind of just worked great. The great thing about chairs is that they change the posture of the actors. Some chairs don't let them get comfortable at all. Others let them get too comfortable. Hello, Bernie. Hello, Tom. What's the rumpus? And others encourage them to be a little theatrical. None of these uses are mutually exclusive. In fact, the most fun happens when you start with one thing and end up with something else. In this scene from Playtime, listen to the sound the chair makes. It's a simple joke, but a few minutes later, that joke gets extended with two people and two chairs. <laughs> And as the chair keeps reappearing in scene after scene after scene, it becomes a much larger joke about how modern people always buy the same damn chairs. This is what great production design can get you. That one detail that pays off in unexpected ways. And it doesn't have to be a chair. They're just very common and pretty cheap. The next time you have a scene and you ask the actors to sit, consider this. What do they sit on? This is real. And is there a way for that object to be something more? Okay. Um, so I'm just going to go back to that um, uh, image and hopefully not autoplay. Um, so in cinema, production design includes everything that you can see on screen that is not the actors. So that means it includes the sets, the locations, all of the furnishings, the props, all of the food, the vehicles, graphics, animals, special effects, weapons, and yes, of course, chairs. Um, in live performance, when we talk about production design, that includes scenery, props, and costumes, and is supplemented by lighting and sound design. And chairs. And chairs. <laughs> um, so we thought we'd just briefly try to explain the design process in stage and screen, and we sort of distilled it down to three key facets or words. One, to, to collaborate. So to collaborate with others in the field to realise this production. To conceptualise the spaces and characters to support the telling of the story. And that's very important, that supporting the telling of the story. And three, to realise those concepts, those, those ideas that you've conceptualised in the form of scenery, environments, props, and costumes. And this lovely image here. Yeah, this is an image here of, um, in fact, it's, it's sitting at the production desk of um, in the theatre in Brisbane. And in the foreground is the model, the, the one in 25 model of Much Ado About Nothing. And actually in the background is the actual set. So, uh, and to, to the left is um, a lighting designer actually sitting at the left of that, and to the right would be the sound designer. But all of these people, the director, the set and costume designer, the sound designer and the lighting designer, are 
are all collaborating, are all conceptualizing, and are all in the process of realizing, in this case, much ado about nothing. Um, so collaboration, so one of the key facets of production design is that it's fundamentally collaborative. So we don't ever work as solos. It's not like a visual artist who might make work by themselves and realize the work in, in its entirety. When we talk about design for storytelling, it's fundamentally collaborative. So it's working with a group of people to realize a project and to tell a story effectively. So there may be as little as a few people or as many as hundreds, but it always involves working with others. Um, a couple of images here, a student crew having just wrapped shooting uh, on the left there. And on the right there, that's a group of um, master's students with me, actually we're installing uh, the Australian Student Exhibition at the Prague Quadrennial of Performance Design and Space in 2019. And so you can see we're all in there working together to realise that outcome. Um, so it's a very collaborative field. So conceptual skills is, is in a sense, these skills that we want to develop in, in our students, and they're, they're really where you've, you've, you've perhaps identified some themes or ideas in a text or a piece of music or, or, or whatever, and you've, you, your, your task really is to kind of find a way of conceptualising those ideas. You do that through script analysis, you research the brief, and then you begin to articulate that brief. Um, you develop and refine ideas through research, testing and refinement, and you'd use a whole lot of different tools in order to do that. This, this image here is of a scale set model on the left-hand side. Um, this was for the Caucasian Chalk Circle back in 2016. And, and in a sense, the image on the left, the model is my way of explaining to a group of people what, a, what the concept is for this plate. On the right hand side is actually a set being bumped into the theatre. You can see, you can see that element of the, um, the sort of mountainscape, one of those cloths there and the, the next cloth is being rigged on the floor and is about to be pulled up. So yeah, that's, this is a, really a slide that, that is saying, uh, look at the journey between the concept and the reality. Um, and then also designers need technical skills. So that's the ways we document the design ideas for translation by the team, who's gonna help you realize this. So in realizing the work, we need a bunch of technical skills. And um, as one of my colleagues likes to say, the skills unlock the ideas. So you, have, you can have all these brilliant ideas kicking around in your mind, but this is the way that we share them. So that includes skills like drafting, model making, drawing and computer skills, including Photoshop and Illustrator. Um, and it also includes the introduction to the kind of making and realizing your design. So good designers have some understanding. We may not be the most skilled artisans, but we work with the people who are gonna realize design. So we have knowledge in painting, building, sculpting, sewing, all of those kind of things. Um, and the images on this slide are from a production I did um, in 2018 called The Edge of the Bush, which is an Australian noir comedy um, by the brilliant and slightly mad Anne Edmonds. And you can see on the left here, it's a collection of mood and reference images for the apartment location. Um, in the middle there is a floor plan of the location and how we intended to have it dressed with a bit of reference and some notes and then a still from that um, dress set from the, from the show on the right. We thought we might talk about a couple of case studies now, which hopefully might help to articulate this, this um, process as well, this, this thing called production design. So the first one we're going to talk about is, is actually a project that I worked on. Uh, it took quite a long time, actually. It began in 2018 when I was approached by a director that I regularly worked with. His name's Jason Clarwine, who's a Queensland director. And he asked me if I'd be interested in designing the sets for Othello, the Shakespeare play, with costumes designed by uh, a colleague called Simona Cosentini. And it's not unusual for costumes and set to be designed by separate um, designers. You, uh, often we'll do both set and costumes, but not uncommon to be assigned one or the other. And then the lighting was by Ben Hughes and the sound design Greg Watkins. 
the brief for this play. So the first thing that you get asked to do a play, the first thing you really want to do is find out from the director why are we doing this play? What, what, what is it about this play that you want to do? So it was the first thing Jason said to me, he said, okay, this play is written in 1603 by an Englishman on the other side of the world. So a long way from us in both time and geography. But how might we do it with a setting in a northern Australia, a setting we understand, particularly in Brisbane, at war in the 1940s with a strong Torres Strait Islander connection? The actor Jimmy Barney, who's a brilliant Australian actor, had expressed for some years an interest in playing the role of a fellow. And so this was really the beginning of this whole production was Jimmy and Jason cooking up this idea. He played the title role uh, of Othello and very mu much of the play was translated into his language, the language of the Torres Strait Islanders. So it's a collision. The original play is set in Venice and Cyprus and Jason's reconceptualizing of this play is that it's in Townsville and Thursday Island. So th that's the kind of beginning of everything is the collision between those two things. The one thing that both of those things have, Cyprus and Venice and the Torres Strait, is water. So here are some images from early research. So that was the first sort of talk about it. And I go off and look for images and Jason goes and looks for images, things that might support the way we start thinking about this play. Um, the, it's a combination, this set of images here of uh, images from Thursday Island um, with images found by me and the director that might have a feel about them. The two bottom images, for instance, uh, they were actually Jason's. He just sent those to me saying, Richard, I'm not sure what it is about these, but they say something to me about the way I'm seeing this play. Here, uh, this was an image actually that I found in the library here at Melbourne Uni, believe it or not. It turned out, and there I was flipping through it, and this was on one of the pages. And this, I didn't know it at the time, but this turned out to be a really key image for the dri driving of the whole set. It's a carved figurehead from a traditional canoe from Thursday Island. And the set design ultimately took it, all its cues in terms of colour from this image here. That can often be a thing when you're looking for something you'll be flipping through with no kind of idea what you're really looking for and then suddenly an image comes up that says something to you. The play has a lot of different settings in Venice and in Cyprus there are exteriors and interiors there's day and night a lot of night actually and the ultimate setting is Desdemona's bedroom where a fellow murders her. We decided that the elements of water, earth, fire and wind would provide the materials for the design. So the colours of the image I just showed you, the one just before, would be the palette. The earth is the raw timber floor stained red that you can see in that this rough model that I'm in the images here. The water would be a large, deep swimming pool, well, a pool taking up nearly half the stage and the water would be contained in a black pool, so water and black. Fire will be represented through the lighting off stage as well as floating candles in the final scene. A scene which when he murders her is at the same time being horrific as being incredibly beautiful as well. Wind will be evident when the mosquito curtains, those ones that I drew from that image that Jason sent me in one of the earlier images, we had mosquito curtains that were so light that even the merest breath of wind would, would send them sort of wafting and moving. And in fact, we set up some big fans for the big storm scene to kind of really get them going. This is a plan. So that earlier set of images, the ones that you just saw, were images of a rough model. And now this is a plan of that. This is just a, it shows a little tinny upstage where we will see Othello and Desdemona at the beginning of the play, seen through the doors curtains. Have a look just 
note by the by that my process is still very analog most designers these days draw with CAD programs but I'm still well and truly uh, trapped in the world of the pencil and paper and a drawing board this is a refined version of the earlier one in 50 model so I've come up to one in 25 which is standard practice in the theatre and that, that one in 25 enables you to put a lot more detail into the model even though it's a very simple conceptually it's actually quite complex uh, technically this little set these are some new model photographs and I would like to kind of get a sense of what the model might have in store for the lighting designer I don't want the lighting designer to feel that they have to copy this but I just want to show them the way I'm think, seeing this set being used. And these are some of the draft sets. So while I'm busily making my set model and developing that, the costume designer, Simona, is, is working away on the costumes. This is a set of drawings which are presented at an early stage, just really to give the, the production team a sense of the size of it, the scale, and how much money it might be going to cost. The period of wartime Australia is very clear in these drawings with the, the women's clothes. And this is a sheet of drawings for the women, and this is a sheet of drawings for the men. And just note, you can see in the middle there, some traditional, the traditional Islanders costume. And that little aeroplane on, on his head is actually a model aeroplane, which is very, which is actually accurate. It's the warp aeroplane dance, which was developed by the Thursday Islanders during the Second World War as a traditional dance. Here's an image of some costume fittings of the actor playing Cassio and some of the notes for completion of the costume, breaking down, dying, insignia. All those words that Joe said earlier on, they're all part of this whole process of design. Along with, so while the costumes are being made there, the scenic artist is doing samples for me of the floor. That's what you can see on the right. Three different versions of the red stain. And on the left is a plywood piece, uh, a, a sample of the plywood walls, which was stained a sort of charcoal. And this is very much trying to connect back to that image of that uh, canoe figurehead that I showed you earlier on. We did some tests about whether or not we might to do, like to do some underfloor lighting and the lighting designer became involved at this stage. Just to, so you know, in the end, we didn't use the lighting under the floor. So sometimes in the process of rehearsals, you realise that an idea that you thought was a really great one early on, wouldn't it be fabulous to light up below the, below the stage, ultimately didn't get used. We didn't need it in the end. Here's an image of the finished floor in the workshop and they used real solid rough sawn timber planks, which were really quite beautiful. And then COVID hit us. After I presented all of those designs and they made all of those costumes, COVID put an end to it all. So that was in, that was supposed to happen in 2020. It was rescheduled um, for midway 2021. And once again, we were shut down in Brisbane and eventually we performed it in Cairns without me being there because I was locked down in Melbourne. So I was zooming in to all the technical rehearsals from Melbourne. It was rescheduled in Cairns and finally got up in November last year. It's going to have a season in Brisbane this year, we hope and it will be part of the Brisbane Festival. And then we're expecting that it might take off on a bit of a national tour of some of the other companies. These are just um, four images from the production photographs from the, you know, and this is, you can see very refined lighting now, but particularly that top image, I think it's quite beautiful. So that's about that. Yeah. Um. Uh, and so for my case study, I'm going to take you through um, the SET project, a very unimaginative name. Um, but uh, this is a project we actually did as part of our master's study with the Master of um, Production Design screen students. Um, and uh, in this project, we sort of worked a little bit backwards. So normally we're responding to the story in the brief that we're telling. 
But in conceptualising this um, project, we actually created the space and then allowed people to write to suit the space. So in conceptualising a space that would allow the maximum amount of interesting stories to be told, um, I decided what we needed was a train station um, waiting room. So um, you can see here at the top of this board that some of my reference material that I gathered, some of the boards that I gathered for various parts of the train station, references for what the exterior would look like, what kind of windows you have. There's photos I took at train stations around Melbourne. There's photos from reference, there's photos from all over the world. Um, and then in the bottom there, you can see some of the technical drawings and plans that we generated for how that studio set would look. Um, you can see on the left there, the gray box shows the floor and the change in the floor colors. There's a paint elevations that show the finish and the detailing of the set walls, what they were gonna look like when they were finished. And there's a photo on the right hand side at the bottom there is actually a lit model photo. And I've actually got here, if you can see it, which might be a bit tricky, but I've got here the set model of this train station. This is built at one in 20 scale, which is typical for um, film production. And you can see there, that's our little train station model. This also as a project was impacted by COVID <laughs> because the first time uh, we were running it, um, uh, uh, due to run that project uh, was in March of 2020. We were halfway through building the set when, it, um, when we got shut down, but we did resurrect it the next year and, and went ahead and built it again. Um, and so here we've got a couple of images of, of the students um, uh, working on putting the set together. So they've worked with our workshop team on building the set and installing the set. You can see there, um, they're talking about, oh, um, they're talking about what they need to do, what's going on, um, working on the installation, carrying bits and pieces around. You can see there um, we're installing graphics and signage on the window, um, installing the finishing bits of architraving. Um, and then this is a time lapse of um, the set build. Um, so that time lapse took place over only about a day and a half. So uh, quite a lot of the preparation had been done and the base painting had been done. We put it all together and then we do the finishing. Um, and we actually made a 3D virtual tour, which I will take you over to now. I sincerely hope that, um, that this is working. Um, so you can see here, there's the set in the studio and we made a 3D tour of it. So we can go in through the entryway and have a look around the set. Um, you can see there the seating, the signage on the walls. I'll just jump over here to turn back around. See the ticket office, um, the bathrooms, the signage on the concession stand, um, and looking back into the entryway there. So um, all of this was built by the um, Master of Production Design students um, and with help from our workshop staff. And they did all of the set dressing, all of the graphics um, for this project. It looks fantastic. They did a great job. Um, and they made some projects in that. We were able to make some projects in that in early 2021. Um, so that just gives you a bit of a sense of the kind of worlds that we create and structure we create. I really particularly love the, um, the leaves blown through the station. It's those <laughs> kind of finishing details that make something feel really real and really authentic. Um, okay, so. Um, so just a little bit of um, uh, some example roles that people who study in the Master of Production Design might do and the sort of roles that we work in. So within stage, you might be a set designer or a costume designer or set and costume designer. You might be an assistant or an associate designer. So working with an associate designer, for example, might work with the designer on a an international touring production. So um, the Harry Potter and the Cursed Child would have an associate designer who comes out from um, the original production and um, uh, uh, puts it into the theatres around the world and makes sure that everything looks right. 
Um, you might have a job as a drafts person or as a model maker, assisting a designer. You might work in the costume department or be a props maker. In screen, um, the production designer is the head of the art department and that department is typically the biggest department on any film production. So the production designer will work with an art director who helps to get everything logistically happening and oversees um, the way the designs are installed and built and those kinds of things. The set decorator, so for those of you who might have watched the Oscars, um, the production design award goes also to the set is said, shared with the set decorator. That person's in charge of finishing the set, so putting in all of the furniture and finishes in each set and making them come to life. Could it be the leaves in the floor? The leaves in the floor and the furniture <laughs> and the ticket machine, yeah. they're all the job of the set decorator. Um, the props master, that person looks after all of the props in the film and will make sure that everything happens and they'll work with props makers who then make all of the things and obviously in both stage and screen those props makers are really um, really important roles because we often need things to do magical things that won't hurt people, you know, you need a knife to stab someone that isn't actually going to hurt anybody, um, that kind of thing. So props makers do all those kinds of things. They make things that smash, things that explode, the, all, all manner of things, multiples of things, the thing you can't buy anymore because it's period, whatever it is. Set dresses work with the set decorator, dressing the sets, putting everything together um, and making it all come to life. Um, screen graphic designers, so People who have a graphic design background will often work in the art department making the graphics. So that will be um, the things like the signage that turns up in the set that you're building that in our train station, for example, the ticket window sign is a, is a graphic design. But also when you're shooting on location, often we have to cover things up. If you're shooting a real street um, in Melbourne, but you're pretending it's New York, you can't see a Commonwealth Bank sign in the background. So there'll be a sign made to cover those kind of things up. Um, or and as a set designer, so someone doing the drafting and, and planning and design of the sets that are built for, mm. for roles. And that's just an example of some of the jobs that designers do um, within our industries. There's a real myriad of, of roles available. Mm. Um, and just a little bit before we move on to questions, just a little bit of information about projects that we've got coming up um, from our some of our staff within the design department here. So Richard, you're... Yes, I'm doing, um, it's just, it's actually just about to start rehearsals in Philadelphia. It's a production of Rigoletto that I did, I've done a number of times with a number of different opera companies around the world, most recently in Seattle, just before COVID. And this time in Philadelphia, which sadly I don't think I'll be able to get to because of the you know why. <laughs> you know why. It's a very boring topic. <laughs> um, I am working on Cyrano. Um, I'm also doing another show actually, but I'm working on Cyrano at another theatre company. Another COVID delayed production. Um, actually, our final sixth lockdown in Melbourne. Um, came into effect on our opening night. So we were ready to go, everything was finished. We were in the theatre standing by and, and then we had to go home. Um, but that fortunately is coming back um, at the end of September for a season at the Theatre Company, which is really great, it's a beautiful show. Um, our colleague Christina Smith is designing The Who's Tommy, which is on very soon um, uh, for Victorian Opera. And our colleague Dale Ferguson is working on Counting and Cracking, which um, did originally do a season here at Belvoir Street in Sydney and is touring to the Edinburgh International Festival in September. Um, and that's just a little sample of, of some of the work our design staff have going on currently. So that's our, that's, that's all that we had to say. Um, and so I'll end the show. Um, and does anybody have any questions? Thanks so much for that. Uh, John Richard, that was really wonderful. Hi everyone, my name's Lyle Durkin. I'm from the Faculty of Fine Arts and Music and I have the wonderful pleasure of answering or asking some of those questions that we've had from you tonight. Um, so I'll, I'll get the, we've had a, a few people ask a ver variation on this question and I, we spoke about it just before the session, so it should be a good one. Um, John Richard, we've had a few people ask uh, sort of what backgrounds or what are their, you know, what are the entry requirements to come and do the Master of Production Design? Do students need to have done, you know, a certain degree or have a certain sort of experience? What, what are you looking for? No, not at all, actually. And it's one of the things that's so great about this program in, in particular. So um, we have people come from all over the place to study in the Master of Production Design. Um, 
people who might have done an architecture major or a, they might have done a general film and television degree, they might have done a general theatre or drama studies degree. Um, we have people who come obviously through the Bachelor of Design performance design major, but also from graphic design and architecture and all of the other majors within the Bachelor of Design at Melbourne Uni and affiliated kind of degrees. It's actually one of the strengths of the cohort. We take a very small cohort, it's quite specific field, um, and but we but it means that we get a real diverse mix of students yeah. and so that our cohort get to learn as much from each other and all the different places that come from as they do from us. Awesome. And then what about if somebody has done, say, something that maybe isn't immediately relevant? So say they've done a Bachelor of Arts. Is there like an industry pathway that they could go through? or There is, but of... actually, I mean, we've had students come in who their undergraduate degree was a law degree. I mean, we, we really do. We're not so bothered no. about where people have come from um, uh, in terms of their background. What we're most interested in is how engaged they are with the idea of the field. So for people who've come from those things that wouldn't seem so straightforward, I mean, I think an arts degree is quite related, especially oh, if it is in English or literature or drama or history, that that's what I did. My first degree was an arts degree in those ways. Um, uh, that, that, I mean, that's very related um, skills wise. We teach our, our students how to do the drafting and the model making and all of those things that's part of what we what we teach um, we're mostly interested in people who are genuinely passionate about the field and that's the primary thing it helps if you can get a little bit if you really want to be a theater designer it's a good idea to try and have a go at doing it um, on a student production or a community yeah. play yeah. or a student film just so you can test if you're actually if, if you really like it or not. Um, so sometimes um, when we have applicants um, who show a lot of promise, we'll say, oh, just go get a little bit of experience and come back to us. Um, but yeah, mostly we just want to know that you really want to do it because it's a, it's a quite intensive course and, um, and, it, and it is a very particular field. So you've got to really want to yeah. do it, I think. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, a good sign that somebody is is um, he's up for it is when they walk in and they've seen the latest show at Theatre Works or yeah. they've seen something at Red Stitch or they mm -hmm. you know they're passionate about movies and they want to talk about the way they've been designed the way they yeah. look they may not know how that works that's what we'll do when we're when they're in the program with mm -hmm. us but you know somebody actually you know a bit of someone with a bit of life skills as yeah. well is really is really, very really helpful. Who likes to read, listens to music, goes to the theatre, yeah. etc. Yeah. Awesome. Well, you've, this is dangerous because now I feel like I might be eligible. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you are, Lyle. <laughs> good, good. Um, so that's great. I think there's a few people that are uh, excited to hear that in, in, in the chat there. Um, got a couple more questions. Um, maybe just one here around, I guess, I know you've given some case studies around the stage and the screen specializations, but I, as from, I guess, more of a, I guess, perspective of the core structure or I guess the, the um, you know, the what you're actually doing in those two specializations. Could you, I, what, I guess, what are the differences there from for a student that's maybe trying to decide between one or the other? So, so we don't, you can't do both. You do have to choose a specialization. We do have a lot of applicants who tick that they're interested in both for the um, interview and it's normally clear to us um, which area someone seems more suited towards um, in terms of the sort of approach they have or the interests that they're showing and the way that they think and the way their previous work has developed. Um, so we can, we can normally gauge where we think someone will fit better um, between the two specialisations, but it's largely a shared cohort experience because the skills that you need, like model making and drafting, are really similar between the fields. It's the application of those that is different. Yeah. So largely we diverge in the majors between, um, in the first year it's very concentrated on skills development and learning how to do the job. And the second year is applying that. So the first year you do lots of design projects, you work with your peers either in the Master of Theatre directing or the Master of Film and Television directing, making connections with them and making work with them. 
which then leads towards the graduating projects in the second year that you work with your peers on. Um, so you do lots of skills development and training in that first year. And then in the second year, it's applied. So you make productions here at the BCA. So you work on BCA films or BCA theatre productions with your peers. Um, and also then we do industry placements. So there's industry internships and industry practice is a big part of the second year mm. of the course. So it's about acquiring the skills and then applying the skills largely mm. in terms of the structure. And we're particularly interested in setting up circumstances where designers can make connections, as Joe talked about with, you know, in the case of the stage with the master of directing students. And very often some of those students go on and form creative partnerships that last long after they finished here and that's really exactly what we want to happen and the same thing happens in film so that's probably where they kind of diverge and, and the stage students go off with the master of directing students and form partnerships and the film student our screen designers go off with the film students and form similarly form creative partnerships awesome i think you've you've touched on what was going to be my next question as well so that's good um I've had somebody ask just about those those industry connections. So, I mean, firstly, great, they're there, good. Um, but had maybe you could describe Joe or, or Richard. How how does that work? So, do you know? Do, do is there a new industry connection each year? Like, what sort of drives where students might find themselves in that second year um, with those industry projects? Well, really, we we want the students to lead. Their, where they want to go so that they're setting themselves up as best they can for where they want to head as as they graduate within the screen major most students there's two internship um kind of placements that exist in the industry practice subject in the second year and most screen students just go out and intern on film productions um, and in various roles depending on where they're interested in heading and they try and make sure they get their experience you know, that they need to have and meet the people in the industry who will then employ them. And it's not a 100% employment rate on, on that side, but it's very close to, um, especially at the moment, it's very busy in film production here in Melbourne. And uh, one of the, our alumni... Example of the moment, for instance. Um, yeah, oh, Lynn, yeah. Lynn, so yeah. our graduate from last year, Lynn, um, interned on Faux, which is a feature film shooting here at the moment, um, and was then just has stayed as an employee. Um, that happened in the previous year as well with Eshwa, who interned on Shantaram, and then they just kept him on in the art department when his internship finished. Um, and an alumni from the year before sent me an email just the other day and said, I've seen literally every person in our class and the class below us and the class below that in the last two weeks at studios. Mm. So um, often it just leads you straight into employment. Um, but that's because there's a lot of different roles in the art department. And so it, that's a quite straightforward path into the industry there. Yeah. Theatre is not so straightforward. You know, that's a harder pathway in some respects because, as Joe said, it's narrower. The, the, the options are narrower in the, in the theatre. But students very commonly take on, for instance, like, and it's also connected to the fact that we're busy doing projects outside. For instance, um, a student from last year who's just graduated, I'm now employing her as assistant to do model making and technical drafting for me on, actually I've got two going and two separate projects. And that's not uncommon. Dale Ferguson, who counting and cracking, he's a regular employer of, of students coming out of this program as assistant work, you know, doing model making or whatever. So that's yeah. really important to us. And I guess that's why Joe, had a slide earlier saying this is what we're working on at the moment because us giving them connections into that industry that's where they want to go yeah. so they see us as a sort of pathway in there and I don't mind that at all yeah absolutely also um one of our graduates from last year well actually she's from the class before but she only finished last year because of COVID um uh just sent me an email Corinne, Corinne yeah so she um, has her first professional show opening this week, in fact, yeah. um, which is including a lot of other BCA alumni from her, from her class here at BCA in the Master of Theatre Directing. 
Um, she and she, yeah, too. she's also, she actually is, is having kind of the dream this year. Um, she is a Beeson family fellow at Malthouse Theatre, and she also is a costume designer on an MTC show, Melbourne Theatre Company show this year. Um, so she's having a really yeah. dream, beautiful run. Um, but I guess, I guess the thing that Richard touched on, I'm sorry that my phone won't shut up. Um, uh, all of our staff here at the BCA are practitioners and we are all, we all maintain our professional practice. So um, we have a, really the best design, certainly best performance design staff in the country in yeah. terms of working designers who yeah. are part of our staff. And so that's industry connection as well. So yeah. we're all still part of the industry. So we have those connections in. Well, that sounds you, again. You're, you're selling me, Joe. You got to stop. <laughs> um, uh, one, one final really question. Good course. We're quite proud yeah. of it. <laughs> yeah, good. One final question, just around. I, you've sort of alluded to this already, but I know a lot of students. You know, particularly maybe if you haven't studied for a little while, um, have some questions, I guess, around that the student experience side of it. So. It sounds like obviously everybody works really closely together, but did either of you have, like, I guess, some examples or, or how, how does how do, a student turns up on day one? How do they suddenly find themselves making these connections? How, how are those? How do you end up talking to the, the directing students? How does that sort of work? Oh, it's embedded in the curriculum. So in the first semester of the course, the students have um, a subject which they do with their peers in either film and television or, or in stage. Um, so it's embedded in the course from, from the beginning. Um, we're actually, excitingly, the Master of Dance has had a couple of years of hiatus and is restarting this year. And we're actually starting a master's cohort um, kind of interaction beyond the formal things in the, in the curriculum as well. Which, so that's um, getting underway as we come back to campus, which is really exciting. Um, and... Um, and so, so it's embedded that you yeah. like you just doing projects together um, with your with your peers in the various like it, it's embedded in the curriculum. And, and we so. have um, like every master's student that comes to us is allocated a, a a workspace that is theirs. So, like all the first years, film and stage will find themselves in the same studio together in their workspaces. So they. Yeah. automatically form a bond they become this little band of designers yeah. <laughs> um, and we have a room for the first years and one for the second years quite lovely spaces up here in the elizabeth burdock yeah. so that really helps actually I it, mean, does. It, it, it feels like mm. they have a home here rather than kind of just get on the tram come down for your class and go away again it's yeah. not like that at all yeah. They, they live here for two years, basically. Go yeah. off and do their part-time job every now and then. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, and, be, and because it's a collaborative field, it just, you have to be with the other people mm. doing things. So, so it, it just sort of naturally happens. It's not a, it's not a career path for people who are lone wolves, really. No. You know, like if you like being by yourself a lot, it's not, it's not the way to come yeah. because it just is inherently working with people all the time. Mm. Fabric. It's very different from for instance, the Master of Visual Arts, which is genuinely the lone yeah. wolf. You know, that is a kind of person who has their own artistic vision and that's what they want to do. This is much more about groups of people finding a common language, a yeah. common set of responses to a given brief, whatever that is, whether it's a fellow or, yeah. I don't know, a film, film script. Yeah. Or so a movie. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Excellent. Well, I think that's a really good note to end on. Um, and I'm sure anybody watching along uh, at home is, is feeling as inspired as I am and hopefully more. Um, so uh, I guess just thank you so much, um, uh, Joe and Richard, for that wonderful presentation and for answering all of those questions um, as well. Um, what we'll do I, now is I, I guess... guess I would just like to say that if anyone does have further questions, I'm happy for people yeah. to contact me. You can find us on the VCA staff website. Um, to get in touch with us if you're interested in getting more information. I'm happy to sure. respond to anyone with questions. Absolutely. Excellent. I uh, will make sure students can access those emails and wait for a flood of, flood of emails. <laughs> um, <laughs> All right. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, everybody. Um, thanks, thanks for tuning everyone. in and taking some time out of your evening. Uh, we'll catch you next time.